Right everyone, it's finally happening. Today I'm going to be cutting my workbench in half and turning it into a truly folding workbench. Now, this idea came from Kezaman about 10-11 months ago, quite soon after I posted the original folding workbench video. And he said, why not cut it in half and put a couple of hinges underneath the CLS joists. I've been mulling over how to do this for quite some time now and I bought these marine hinges on the internet. Neat though these hinges are, they've got two problems. Number one, the two main supporting screw holes are perilously close to the edge of the the timber beam that runs underneath the workbench and I just wouldn't, they'd probably be all right but I want something really strong and sturdy. But the second point which is a more important one is these hinges do not have a removable pin. Now there are various hinges on the internet that you can see, a few links coming up on the screen now, that do have removable pins but they all have this problem. They're either too wide for this supporting beam or the hinges are too close to the edge. So I had to go back to the drawing board and it's taken me about 11 months to mull this over while I've been doing all the other videos on my channel. And the answer came last weekend when I paid a trip down to my local DIY agricultural sort of farm supply store. They've got a metal shop there and I was chatting to the guy who works in there uh, about my problem and he said, hmm, it's very expensive to make new hinges but why don't you get a couple of hook and band hinges Cut the middle out of one, the edges off the other, link them together, and by using a bolt like this, you've got yourself a fantastic removable pinned hinge. A word of warning though, if you're gonna buy this system, do not buy an unthreaded bolt because the unthreaded section of the bolt does not fit into the hinge. I'm pretty sure the 58 millimeter long bolts that I use in this video are the longest bolts they do without an unthreaded section. And just look how sturdy this hinge is gonna be compared to this marine hinge. I can put a massive bolt through there, locking it in place, and then a couple of screws further down. And what is gonna be so crucial in this design, that hinge is gonna take so much pounding and beating without even showing any signs of wear. So job one. I've got to mark out what needs to be removed. The hinge is 38 millimeters wide, so if we go a third, a third, a third, so if we do our cuts at 12 and a half, 12.6 really, isn't it? But we'll get as close to that as we can. Now, to remove the, each part of the hinge, I'm going to be using my grinder. Normally, I would use just a typical metal cutting disc like this, but look what I found at the same place. You can get these discs here that are so much thinner and I reckon that's going to do a much cleaner, quicker, better cut. So let's see how we get on. Stanley Gloves bought these on Screwfix recently, about six quid. Details of everything I've used today will be in the description at the end of this video. Love these gloves. Use them for gardening, DIY, everything. Finally, absolutely crucial when you're cutting metal. Don't forget the safety specs. Somebody commented on my channel recently that they blinded themselves in one eye when they were cutting metal when they forgot to put these on. new blades look at that in about a minute knife through butter hard thing now is going to be removing this though and to do that I think I'm gonna to have to cut a few more pieces out of there just shows you how brilliant these thin blades are because you'd never be able to get that sort of cut with a standard metal blade. Now I'm going to use my thicker grinder disc to finish off the job.
That's looking pretty good, I would say. Now I've just got to do the, um, the mating section. I've come outside for this bit because this is producing quite a lot of filings all over the garage floor. When you're doing this, this is obviously the first time I've done it, so I'm sort of learning as I'm going along. Because I'm cutting on the line and obviously the blade is a few millimetres thick. You will end up with a little bit of play on the hinges if you literally cut on the line. So when you do your central section, you might just want to cut on the other side of the line so that it fits more snugly with the two outside pieces. So I'm going to replicate this now and use that one as another one of these. And then when I do the center cuts, I'm going to take my blade on the other side of the line so that this fits a little bit less loosely into the middle. Obviously you don't want to make it too wide because then you're going to have a hell of a job sanding it down. But it's just a word of caution. And there we go. That was much quicker than the other one. Right, there's just a little bit of adjustment now um, to get the the two parts of the strap hinge in exactly the right place. You see here, I don't know whether you can see that on the camera, but it's just catching in that top left hand corner. And to make these fine adjustments, I'm you back to the really thin blade because I found this to be a fantastic way to make very minute adjustments. that here we go we're done I've made the second hinge collar in the middle just a little bit too wide so what I'm doing now is I'm using this metal file just to give it a little bit of a trim and the metal file is great because it gives you a much more consistent edge than you'd get with the grinder or with a belt sander okay so my two band hinges are now fully modified and it's on with the next part of the project in case you're wondering how much of the discs I've worn down, I actually use one disc to cut out the internal sections and then another disc for the external parts. So that was what was worn off for the first disc. And that was for the second. So virtually nothing could have done the whole thing with one disc. And I am really impressed with these little discs. Now, crucially, I have gone with 14 millimeter diameter bolts. What's brilliant about these 14 millimeter diameter bolts is you can see here, there's pretty much no play in the hinges at all. No horizontal or vertical play in it. And this is what I wanted because when the bench goes together, I didn't want to have a sort of mismatch on the surface because of the play in the hinges. So in preparation for the next section, I bought two replacement CLS beams to go underneath the workbench because with the two workbenches separate, I want to be able to position the saw horses equally apart on the beam. And my existing cuts on the saw horse may not be in the right place for this. Right, so I'm going to cut the workbench in half, so this is the easy bit. What I'm going to do first is cut the actual tabletop itself leaving the CLSs intact and then remove it from the CLS beams and <clears throat> then I can cut the beams separately. And I'm going to use my circular saw and this homemade saw guide. I'm going to be posting a video soon with a much better saw guide than this. These things are incredibly useful, can't recommend them highly enough. I'm also using these Axminster trade clamps which have featured extensively in my videos recently. They're particularly useful when you're doing a lot of work on a work table like this. Remember when you're using a circular saw you want to set the cutting height of the blade just below the surface that you're cutting through because that way you minimize the wander on the blade.
Now it's time to remove the screws. I'm hoping I didn't glue it down. Now I did have a comment on my original workbench video um, last week from Michael Palmer who's been a joiner for 42 years and he made a very good point which um, I have to say has concerned me a bit in the past. His point is that if you pass the spring line, i.e. 50% down the joist, i.e. you're cutting more than halfway down the beam, you're notching out and what this is do does is it fundamentally weakens the beam to the point where it might fail. Now that's a very good point and I've got to be grateful for Michael for raising it. I did make the point back to him that the combined strength of the beam and the workbenches themselves I think is more than strong enough for most of the jobs that you and I will be doing on this workbench even if you are as Michael says notching out. For example I could stand on these beams quite happily and there's no sign of them showing any weakness doesn't look like they're going to crack anytime soon. Look, I'm jumping up and down on them. So, whilst Michael's right in theory, I think in practice we're absolutely fine with this. That said, I've got to say that notch looks a lot better than that notch. So, for the new CLS beams, I'm going to only notch halfway in because there's no obvious loss in stability but also because with my new folding workbench there are going to be four notches rather than two on each beam so that I can have two standalone workbenches as long as one long one and if you're interested to know what the dimensions were for the workbench and for where I position the notches that's on screen now. So then it's just a question of cutting the two 4x2 lengths of CLS in half and then cutting the notches into those 4x2 timbers. For exhaustive instructions on how I set the angle of the notch, created a template for that. Take a look at my original folding workbench video which is coming up on screen now. The only difference I've made this time around is making a template out of ply rather than cardboard because I wanted a really accurate template because it's very important to get the angles right but also to get the angle right on the timber itself so that the beam sits perfectly horizontally on the sawhorse. If you don't do this, you might find that the sawhorse itself can never sit totally flat on the floor with the result that the work table rocks around a little bit. So this time around I found much the easiest thing to do after cutting the two vertical sections to just use a chisel to, to lightly tap out the notch. And having done two notches, I laid one timber on top of the other to get the notch is in roughly the right place for the second CLS and then it was just a question of marking the exact position using the hardboard template that I made earlier. Okay the supporting beams are all notched and I think the next stage is to put the hinges on. I want the bits of wood to stay together so as a precaution I'm clamping the beams tight up against each other my workbench. What I'm going to do is secure it down with these 6x70s. I'm drilling a little pilot hole slightly narrower in diameter than the screw just to get the screw exactly in the right place on the hinge. I've been wondering how to get the uh, hinges in the centre of the beams so what I've decided to do is just eye up the bolt so that the point in the bolt as you can see here fits right in the middle of the beam. I have bought these bolts to uh, insert into the square bolt hole on the strap but to be honest with you these are going to be so strong with the screws they've got in already that I've decided rather lazily to make do with my 6x70s just because otherwise I'd have to recess a hole for the nut and all the rest of it and this is so much easier. 
So my beams are now fully attached and I've got to say I'm pretty happy with that. A bit of a dry run. I'm just getting the timbers out to see how they perform when pushed down onto the saw horses. Right, that's rock solid. And what I'm really, really pleased about is that when I put a straight edge on the beam, these hinges are keeping it absolutely straight. There's no sagging in the middle at all. Top of my workbench is looking a little bit knackered. I've cut it in the old place with the circular saw. It's got a bit of paint on it, so I'm going to give it a fresh lease of life. I'm going to turn it upside down. Giving me a lovely fresh workbench. For this I'm using these decking screws, 4.5 by 75s, but anything really goes for this. Now before you screw the worktop down to uh, the beams below, it's worth pointing out one thing. The weight of the worktop has very slightly pushed the workbench down. You can see here, it's almost imperceptible, but there's a sort of one, two millimetre gap on below the straight edge where the table has sagged down just a little bit. Now you don't really want this when you're working. So what I've done is I've just put a couple of bits of timber underneath the workbench just to bring it up to exactly where it needs to be. You see now it's absolutely flat and I've just put a very, very slight angle on this edge so that if the workbench does want to slightly sag, it can't because of the angle between the two pieces. With that done, I can push the two bits together, clamp them, stop them moving, and then screw them down. And I'm hoping now, when I remove the stays I put underneath. Yes, the workbench is beautifully straight with no sagging at all. So that's it, the folding workbench is finished. Let's see how easy it is to fold up. That was reasonably straightforward. Now, the other thing I have found is when you're putting the workbench together, assuming you're having it in one long piece like this, which you may or may not do, I have found it's a bit disobedient. When you pick it up, it tries to sort of concertina like that. So I bought these toggle and plates from B&Q, toggle clasps. And what I'm planning to do to the saw horses in the way that I always have without the two halves coming apart. What I probably need to do now is make some carry handles so that I can easily pick it up but it's already much easier to manoeuvre around than that old workbench was in one great big piece. But don't forget, the great thing about this is I can take out the bolts, the workbench just comes apart, enabling me now to store the workbench in a way that I could only have dreamt of doing this morning. And the beauty of this now is that storage is suddenly really easy. 
And don't forget, with the workbench dismantle, which is why I made it with these two notches, we can just get a small work table out when we need one. which you can configure however you want, depending on the project you're working on. So that's it for today, everyone. I hope you found this video useful. As ever, details of all the tools I've used today will be in the description at the end of the video. Now, in next week's video, I will be peppering the lovely surface of this worktop with holes, because I'm gonna be installing the Peter Parfit UKJ Path Guide system. So stay tuned for that, because I think it'll be the final step in making this the ultimate folding workbench for us DIYers. If you've liked today's video, please click on the like button below. And as ever, if you're new to my channel, I would absolutely love to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here.